Well, good to meet you. <laughs> Shalom, everybody. I can say, wait, I'm in Texas. Shalom, y'all. <laughs> Great to be here. Uh, do we just begin? Should I just go? All right. <laughs> Let's pray as we get ready. Father, we just praise you, bless you, thank you. Father, we just lift you up. We thank you that you are here, and we thank you you're in our midst. We thank you, Father, that you're in our lives. And now I ask, Lord, that you would speak. Father, speak your word and have your way and touch your people and have us ready. We bless you and praise you in the name of Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah. And God's people say, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Wow, the Lord is alive here in Texas. <laughs> Greetings from the promised land, the holy land, New Jersey. <laughs> I'm always flying out of Newark all the time, and now they tell me I'm in Newark. <laughs> it, but it's very different than the Newark I know, you know. There, you know, here you have the cows, there we have McDonald's. That's about, you know. But it's great to be here. Um, uh, what a tremendous thing you have here. Uh, blessed uh, with the pastors, with uh, the, the Copelands, and all, all that God is doing. It's an honor to be here. Um, a few things before we get rolling. Uh, often, I haven't, didn't do this before, but people had asked, and so, you want to see my family? Yeah. Should have an image up there of, the, uh, of my two boys. <laughs> That's Eliel, he's five years old, and that's, that's Diel, is three years old. And uh, recently I was home and my five-year-old said, you know, Dad, we want to do a surprise for you. We wanna, I wanted to, to kind of make the house look like a hotel so you could feel at home. <laughs> I was anointing my wife who was sick at, for healing, and my son Eliel said, you know, what are you doing? I said, well, you know, I said, remember how the prophet Samuel anointed David, and he said, oh yeah, and then he thought, and then he, then he, he asked, he said, Dad, he said, is she going to become king? I said, no, not on my watch. <laughs> I was recently asked to speak at Capitol Hill to leaders and members of Congress. It was the day after the Supreme Court heard the case that would decide marriage, and it was a prophetic moment, and we are going to have a clip of that at the end. I want to show you to encourage you. And something else at the end, I want to give you the ironic blessing that God himself gave to bless you. And no, no matter how much I share tonight, I can only touch on the mysteries. I don't have, I didn't bring DVDs or books or anything, but they have some, a limited uh, supply from the ministry. So there you can get it there, or you can order it, or they have it everywhere. But I'll just quickly tell you what there are. One is the mystery of the Shemitah, which they should have there after the service. Uh, the second is the Harbinger, which is what began this, the first revelation. The third is the Harbinger Decoded, which is like a prophetic explosion where you actually see the Harbingers unfold. And the last one, um, that's on DVD, and the last one is the Mystery of the Shemitah Unlocked, which is just, they did a, I'm in it, I didn't make it, but it's a very powerful, powerful way of seeing it. So that should either be there or you can get it. But now, as we begin, do, is there a Bible here? I'm sure you have tons of Bibles. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'll take anybody's Bible. Thank you. All right. I'm going to open up from 2 Kings. 2 Kings and, ver and chapter 17. Second Kings 17. And it says this, of the final days, the last days of Israel, verse 7, it was that the children of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, which had brought them out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and had 
feared other gods and walked in the statutes of the pagans whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel and of the kings of Israel which they had made. And the children of Israel did secretly things that were not right against the Lord their God. They built high places in their cities from the tower of the watchmen to the fenced city. They set them up images and groves in every high hill and under every green tree. And there they burned incense in all the high places and did, as did the pagans whom the Lord carried away and did wicked things to provoke the Lord to anger. They served idols of the, which the Lord said, you shall not do this thing. Yet the Lord testified against Israel, against Judah, by all the prophets and by all the seers, saying, Turn from your evil ways, keep my commandments and my statutes according to all the law which I command your fathers, which I have sent you by my servants, the prophets, notwithstanding they would not hear. And they hardened their necks like the necks of their fathers and didn't believe in the Lord their God. And it goes on to say, as they lifted up their children as sacrifices, and therefore the Lord removed them from the land. We are living in the end times. We are in critical times. And you need to be aware, we need to be aware of what's happening. I have much to share with you. I can only touch on some of the things here. For those of you who don't know the harbinger, in a nutshell, is it possible that there exists an ancient mystery that lies behind everything from 9-11 to the collapse of Wall Street that warns of coming calamity? In the last days of ancient Israel, as we read right here, nine harbingers, nine prophetic signs appear in the land, warning of judgment. The amazing thing or the stunning thing is the same nine harbingers have now reappeared on American soil. Some in New York City, some in Washington, D.C., some have involved objects, some have involved leaders, pronounce, actually pronouncing judgment without realizing what they're doing, even the President of the United States. And since the harbinger came out, they have not stopped, they've continued to manifest. We only have time to touch on that as I share other things, but I'll give an example. The fourth harbinger in the book, when God first warned Israel of the coming judgment, he allowed the nation to be shaken. He allowed the hedge of protection to be lifted up temporarily because God is a God of mercy who warns before judgment. And so he allowed an enemy to make an attack on the land to shake them, to bring them back to him. But Israel did not come back. They responded with defiance. They said, we're going to come back stronger against God. We're going to rebuild what was fallen, stronger, higher, greater. The prophet Isaiah records it in Isaiah 9:10. That's the beginning of the harbingers. Not long ago in the scheme of history, America's hedge of protection was removed. An enemy was allowed to make a strike on the land. It was a shaking, and for a time it looked like there was going to be revival. People flocked to churches after 9-11, and they said, God bless America. But there was no real revival, because when, in order to have revival, you have to have repentance. Without repentance, there's no revival. So what's happened is America, instead of growing closer, has grown farther from God. And they made that vow. In the ancient version of the Bible called the Septuagint, the rabbis translated the vow of Isaac, that they made after the attack the bricks have fallen, but we will rebuild with quarried stone higher and taller. And they translated it like this. They said, the bricks have fallen. Come, let us build for ourselves a tower. Well, they took the words from Babel. A tower of defiance would rise from the ruins. What happened at Ground Zero? America, the leaders vowed we're coming back stronger and stronger, but without God. And what happened is they started building a tower a tower that they said was a tower of defiance. Now, there turned out there was a scripture hidden in Ground Zero. A photographer took a picture of it in the ruins. He was whisked out of it, and he looked at his camera. When he saw the scripture, he began to break down and weep. What was the scripture? The scripture was, come let us build for ourselves a tower. They took it from Babel. And it's on that ground that a tower began rising and rising and rising. In the last days of ancient Israel, the leaders pronounced this ancient vow. And that vow brought judgment, brought destruction. And in Hebrew, that vow is only eight words, eight Hebrew words. After the harbinger came out, the president, Obama, came down to ground zero. And they showed him the tower. 
They showed him the beam that would be the final beam crowning the tower. And they asked him to inscribe words, so he inscribed words on the tower. He could put anything he wanted on there. What did he put on there? In modern American prose, he put down on the beam of the tower the vow of defiance that brought judgment. And he did it in English, eight English words that matched the eight Hebrew words of ancient Israel that brought destruction. So America had its own Tower of Babel rising, and only in this year has it reached its completion. Now the harbingers that have continued do not take place in a vacuum. The pattern of the harbinger is the nation being warned of God. If it doesn't come back to God, it grows worse and farther from God. That is what we are watching today. We are watching America fall from God. As did ancient Israel, the same pattern. Subtly at first, then more overtly. As did ancient Israel, this nation that was founded on God. You see, there's only two nations in the world we know of that were founded solely on the Word of God, and one was Israel and the other was America. And America has been blessed of God more than any other nation, as the Puritan founders prophesied it would be. But as ancient Israel did, America has also fallen. Ancient Israel, what they did is they, they started driving God out of the public square, God out of the government, God out of their culture. They started calling what was evil good and what was good evil. They started lifting up their children as sacrifices. Well, America has done the same thing. We have also driven God from the public square, driven God from our culture, and we have also called, this nation has called evil good and good evil. And in the same way, people say, well, how can you compare lifting up children? They lifted up children on the altars of Baal and Moloch as sacrifices. Well, yes, Israel lifted up thousands, but America has lifted up millions. The prophet said, those who call evil good and good evil, well, they, well, they call evil good, you will call what is good evil. And that's exactly what we are beginning to witness now. The beginning of persecution. I'm going to read to you a quote. You might think it came from Joseph Stalin of the Communist Party. It is this. Deep-seated religious beliefs must be changed. Who said it? Not the Communist Party, but the chief Democratic candidate for president. And the reason it was said is because they said deep-seated religious beliefs must be changed so that abortion can increase. This is the new America. There is an organization that, is, that exists to basically attack Christians and calls Christian groups hate groups. This past week or so, the government had decided to set up a, an organization or a a department of domestic terrorism to watch over groups that it deems suspicious. Well, the one who hosted, the group that hosted this meeting was this anti-Christian group. This is the new America. These are the end times. This is the time of our testing, and we must stand. Ezekiel the prophet is brought into the temple of God, and he is shown in the temple Idols fill the temple, the holy place. And God says, do you see, son of man, what they are doing? They are desecrating the holy place. Judgment will come. In the palace of Babylon, the king is, throws a party. And he calls for the vessels of the temple of God of Jerusalem to be brought into the celebration, to be lifted up, to be drunk from, and lifted up to the gods of Babylon. They are taking, this is an act of desecration, taking what is holy, what is dedicated to God, and turning it against God. And at the moment they do that, the Bible says, a hand appears on the wall, writing words in Aramaic that say basically judgment is coming that night. And the principle is, the act of desecration brings judgment, precedes judgment. Well, there is another vessel of God no less sacred than the cups of the temple of Jerusalem. It is the vessel of marriage. To take that vessel and turn it against the purposes of God is an act of desecration. America performed that act this summer, an act of desecration. And all across the country, 
there were rainbow flags waving to celebrate it. Well, the rainbow does not belong to man. The rainbow belongs to God. The rainbow is God's sacred sign of covenant, the first sign of covenant with the creation. What happened to this holy vessel is that this one too was desecrated against the purpose of God. It is a double desecration, a sign of holiness, trumpeting this. And what is that? The creation itself, the order of creation. You know, on America's first day as a fully constituted nation, the first president, George Washington, lays his hand on the Bible and gives a prophetic warning. And he says... The smiles of heaven can never be expected on a nation that disregards the eternal rules of order and right which heaven itself has ordained. If anything was the breaking of it, it was this. And then something else happened that day. The president gave the order to light up the White House in the colors of the rainbow to celebrate. We may have an image of that. I don't remember the White House ever being lit up for anything. And here it is. And what is this? Here it is. This is the, the chief house of the land. It's like the palace of the king of Babylon. And here the handwriting is on the wall in the colors of the rainbow. What is the rainbow? It's a sign of covenant of God's mercy in the face of judgment. What happens if you desecrate that? What is that as well? The rainbow is the colors that surround the throne of God, that God is on the throne. But to desecrate it is for a nation to say, we are not under you, God. We can redefine and change the laws of God and the orders of the creation because we are on the throne. Before Jerusalem was destroyed by the armies of Babylon in 586 B.C., the armies of Babylon broke through the first defensive wall. It was that act that allowed the destruction of Jerusalem to come right after that day that the walls were broken is the 9th of Tammuz in the Hebrew calendar. The day that the Supreme Court struck down the order of God was the 9th of Tammuz. The same day the defensive walls were broken down in Israel. Now let me move forward. Every time something happened with the harbinger, there was always an attack of the enemy. When the harbinger came out, a hurricane, Hurricane Irene, came to our building sweeping three to four feet over the whole ministry when the enemy comes in like a flood. The first time I ever shared about the Harbinger out there and across from New York City and New Jersey, all hell broke loose. The town and the landlord decided to destroy our building as if the enemy was trying to stop that word and the message from going forth. The very existence of the ministry was in danger. The last service we locked our building of 15 years had no building the next day, a different town in New Jersey, the town of Wayne, the board there voted seven to nothing to give us the building there. Our, it was three times the size of our first building. Our first building, they destroyed it. And in its place on the ground of that building that I preached the Harbinger for the first time, they built a Walmart. But in Walmart, there's a book department. They don't have many books there, but one of the books they have is The Harbinger. So on the very ground where I first preached The Harbinger and the enemy tried to stop it, The Harbinger's going forth to America. The enemy cannot win when you're in the will of God. And all hell is coming against you, attacking on all sides. Don't you be discouraged. Be encouraged. It's a good sign because the enemy doesn't waste his energy. And so what it means is it's an attack. He knows there's something of God coming that is greater. God has something greater, but you've got to keep fighting. You've got to push through. Now, let me tell you, I want to do this, and there's a lot to share with you, but I want to share most of the time because I want to tell you this is all God. It's not about man or any person. This is how the harbinger went forth. This is how it happened. I was... Standing across the waters of 9-11, seeing it happen. And I prayed and I got the scripture about how when the first warning came to ancient Israel. And about a week later, David Wilkerson in New York City 
he preached a message saying the word of God for America is, and then he went through Isaiah 9, 10, the Harbinger Scripture. He didn't know about the Harbingers. He just got that from God. And then I was standing later on. I was in New York City on the ground, not, ground zero, and I see this tree that was struck down. And something says, you have to search this out. There is something you have to find here. And as I started searching, it was like one puzzle piece, the next puzzle piece. Everything kept coming, and whenever I needed the next key, somebody would say a word that would be the next key. Or somehow I'd be on my computer typing, and something would come that I didn't ask for on my computer that was the next key. Until finally I was blown away. I shared it. Everybody said, this has got to go to America. Finally, a while later, I said, okay, let me, let me put it down. I start writing. But when I started writing it, in the way that you read it with a, with a narrative of a prophet giving this, the words just flowed out. It basically wrote itself. It was the easiest thing I ever did. I don't know how to write books. It just wrote itself. And then I finished. And people said, well, how to, you know, now you have to get it published. Well, someone said to me, you know, you need to make a name for yourself. I mean, people know you here, but they won't. The publisher won't. I said, we're not doing any of that. But the week that I finished it, I was scheduled to go on an airplane to come to Dallas and to there preach at Promise Keepers. I finish the Harbinger. I go to the airport. It lands in Charlotte. And in Charlotte, I bow my head and I said, God, the Harbinger, that's your message, not mine. You have to bring it forth. You know how to send forth words. You're good at that. You have to do it. Not man, not agents, your hand. I open up my eyes. But before I tell you what happened, let me ask a question. But I shouldn't even ask the question here because I'm in Texas. <laughs> How many people here are into football? Yeah. Okay. Being Jewish, we're not so much, you know? Because for us, it's a lot of very big Gentiles running after an unkosher pigskin. We don't know what to do. <laughs> we don't know what to do. It's scary. We know that somewhere in the Torah, Moses condemned it, but we can't find it. <laughs> but if you're into football, you know this, that the greatest play in Super Bowl history is called the helmet catch. A man named David Tyree, New York Giants, jumps up and gets the ball on his helmet. And that changes the game. What a lot of people don't know is David Tyree is a born-again Christian. He loves the Lord. And he was praying, God, I want a platform. I want to share the gospel more than anything else. Before he went into that game, a man gave him a word, a prophecy, saying God is going to take you out of the shadows, put you on a platform, the whole world's going to know you. And he went in there knowing there was going to be a catch. And he's in the, everybody's watching around the world. He's there saying, God, is it this? Was it this catch? Was it? And then it happened. And then he writes a book about it and mentions the guy's name who gave him the prophecy. Okay, back to the airport. I prayed the prayer. Lord, you send this forth. I open my eyes. There's a man sitting to my left. He turns to me and he says, so what's the good word? I said, so what's the good word? I said, God loves you. He says, I know that. I said, so he says, what's the good word? So I don't know what to do. I'm witnessing to this guy. And he's witnessing back. <laughs> we're trying to save each other until we realize we're saved. And then he turns to me and he says, Jonathan, you wrote a book. This book is of God. God is going to send it across America and the world. He's going to do it by his hand, not by the hand of man. And, he's, and things are going to change from here on in. It turned out the man sitting next to me is the man who gave the prophecy to David Tyree at the Super Bowl. And he was not supposed to be on that flight. He was on another flight, but the weather kept canceling his plans until they put him on my flight. And he sits down next to me just as I'm praying the prayer. And he looks at me and says, God spoke to him that moment and says, you must give this word to this man. And he said, he said to the Lord in prayer, no, Lord, I can't do that. And for, you're going to find this amazing. I know this is shocking, but for some reason, he thought I looked Jewish. <laughs> I know. And I'm wearing black, and I'm kind of going like this a little bit. And he said, oh, no, he's Orthodox. He said it was literally in pain until he opened his mouth and gave me the word. And because, because he was the one who was mentioned in the book and the one who published the book was Charisma, 
This man sent word to Charisma, and a little while later, I get, oh, I get contact from the president of Charisma Publishing, Steve Strang, who says, we heard what happened at the airport. We heard about this thing called the Harbinger. We've got no idea what it is, but we're interested. And that's how the Harbinger went forth to America, not by the hand of man, but by the hand of God. It is God behind all these things. Now, I'm going to open up a mystery just for a moment, because I'm just touching on some things, but here, from the mystery of the Shemitah, we can't even begin to touch what's in the book, but in a nutshell, the Shemitah is the seven-year mystery of God. It's the Sabbath year. Every seventh year was called the Shemitah, where there's rest, the economy stops, basically. And in the last day of the Shemitah, it's called Elul 29, on that last day, all debts are wiped out, credits wiped out. Now, this is a blessing for those who follow God. But when Israel turned against God, this blessing becomes a sign of judgment of a nation that knew God and turned away from Him. The mystery of the street is 3,000 years old beyond that. It lies behind the rise and fall of the stock market, the economy, even the rise and fall of nations. When global cataclysms come, world wars, 9-11, all linked together when nations rise and fall. Now there was that one day, Elul 29, it's called the day of the Shemitah, the day of remission, all financial accounts wiped clean. September 2001 saw the greatest point crash in Wall Street history, wiping out massive amounts. When did it take place? The greatest day up to that day in history Wiping away the financial accounts took place on September 17, 2001. It was the day of the Shemitah that comes only once every seven years. On that exact day comes the greatest wiping out. The record held for seven years until September 29, 2008, when came the greatest crash in Wall Street history to this day. And when did that one take place? It took place on the exact same biblical day that God appointed in His Word. The exact day of the Shemitah, once in seven years, the two greatest crashes, each took place on the same exact day, appointed by God. They were separated, according to the mystery, separated by seven Hebrew biblical years, down to the day, down to the hour, the week, the, the minute that of the closing bell, only the hand of God can do that. And what this is saying is, the Shemitah says, that God is the one who's in charge of blessing. A nation's blessings do not come from, the, from itself, it comes from God. And you cannot defy God and drive Him out and expect the blessings to remain on that nation. Now I caution continually, you cannot look to dates. We, God is sovereign. He doesn't have to do everything by any, any period except as He wills. But I'll share this. The most central pattern of the Shemitah is a rising stock market that begins to reverse its momentum, begins a long-term collapse. It's exactly what happened in this present Shemitah. And the long-term collapse included Black Monday, the worst intraday crash in Wall Street history, some of the greatest crash days ever. The most recent speaker, you know, the, the engine of the world economy is now China. It wiped out almost half of the Chinese financial realm. It wiped away $2 trillion of the American market. It marked, it actually wiped out $11 trillion of the world's markets. This Shemitah has marked a great change in the course of history because this Shemitah ended the American age that began in 1871 when America became the strongest economic power on earth, supplanting the British Empire. That age came to an end when China supplanted America. If nothing, this is, we are in, as the Bible says, the latter days. When, we, when change must happen. I'm going to share something right now. I have not shared it outside of our congregation, as far as that, but the Bible speaks of three abominations which bring judgment. The first, when Israel offered up its children to God, actually to their God, which was Baal and Moloch. America has done the same. In the early 1970s, America legalized the killing of unborn children. There's a chapter in the mystery of the Shemitah concerning the towers. Towers in the Bible often represent pride or a nation or a kingdom's power.
but also it says when judgment comes, it comes against the towers. The World Trade Center was built to show the glory of America, the preeminence of America. But the same hand, what people don't know, the same hand that signed the paper to begin the building of the tower is the same hand that signed the paper to begin abortion in America. The tower was completed in 1973. Abortion was legalized in 1973. The tower stood for the years that this began. And the Bible says when judgment comes, it comes against every high tower. First abomination. The second abomination is that of sexual immorality. And here, what happened in Israel, and it specifically also centers in the Bible on the sin of Sodom. We have spoken about that. Interesting, the tower I spoke to you about that replaced the World Trade Center there at Ground Zero, right after the Supreme Court struck down the ordinance on marriage, what it did is it was lit up in the colors of the rainbow. The same, the Tower of Defiance. But the third one, when Israel drove out God, other gods came in, idols came in. And that's what always happens when a nation drives out God. Now America was beginning to driving out God from the public square. Well, in its place come idols and other gods. It doesn't call it gods, but the God, it still is the same thing. It serves, America serves other things. The God of lust, the God of, the God of immorality, the gods of self. In the last days of Israel, the images of the foreign gods appear in the land before judgment. Well, this summer, the same summer, that saw America cross this line, an image appears in New York City on a tower that once represented the glory of America, the Empire State Building. I want to show you that image. What is that image? That image is an abomination. That image is a god. That image is a foreign god. That is the god Kali. And what happened is, you know, the Kali is the god of darkness. And here, literally, they, they projected all this light on the, on the tower to put the image of the god of darkness. The Bible says, woe to those who put light for darkness. Kali is, it had to be the largest image of a foreign god in the history of earth. And what is Kali? Also the god of death. The, also, Kali is the god of destruction here over New York City. The same image, the images of the last days of Israel. Now, I'm going to share with you a prophetic mystery that we are at the beginning of. It appears at the end of the mystery of the Shemitah, it is called the mystery of the seventh Shemitah. Every seven years was the Shemitah, but every seventh Shemitah, the 49th year, ushered in the Jubilee, a super Shemitah. It always, the Jubilee always has to come after the year of the Shemitah because it's the 50th year, comes after the 49th year, the seventh Shemitah. During the Jubilee, Everyone was released. The Bible says that everyone returns to their family, returns to their land. Whatever you lost, you get it back. Whatever you're, you lost your home, you get it back. You lost your family's inheritance, you get it back. Year of Jubilee, everyone shall return home to their inheritance. Everyone. Well, 2,000 years ago, the Jewish people lost their inheritance. The armies of Rome drove them out of Israel and across the earth. But the Bible says they must return home. Jesus said, I will not come again until my people say, Baruch haba b'ashem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The entire age is waiting. But for them to say that, they have to come back to Israel and back to Jerusalem. Now, for years, you know, that people said it's never going to happen. By, even Christians said this is never going to happen. Even Jewish people said it's never going to happen. It's impossible, impossible. But the Word of God said it would happen. Yes. Now, could it be, could it be, you know, that this mystery of Jubilee restoration of the land could be, give us the timing of end time events and when these happen. You see, you know, for this to come true, you know, everybody was saying it's never going to happen. Everybody was saying, they came up with replacement theology saying that God's finished with the Jewish people except they forgot to tell God about it. <laughs> God is faithful. 
They survived by a miracle. All, every, by a miracle they survived. And then when it's impossible, how did they come back? And what is this mystery for Jesus to come again? Could this mystery, the, here's the key, the Jubilee must take place on the year after the Shemitah. 1917 is the year of the Shemitah. A great global shaking. The word Shemitah means shaking as well. A great shaking, the First World War, empires collapsing. And here it is, now there is a time span, the year after that Shemitah begins September 1917, September 1918, could that be the year of restoration? Here's what happens. The land of Israel is in Muslim hands, the Ottoman Empire, and they're never going to give it back to the Jewish people. But something happens. The year of the Shemitah brings a collapsing of the Ottoman Empire. And they are weakening, and their hold is weakening. And in, in, in Britain there had been a revival, and there had been a love for Israel that came in the revival. And a little British boy prayed every night, Lord, at the end of his prayer, his mother taught him, restore your ancient people to their ancient land. Well, it would come to pass in 1917 in the autumn, British armies march into the Middle East under General Edmund Allenby, enter going to Jerusalem. When Allenby arrives in Jerusalem, he finds the enemy soldiers have taken off. It turned out they misinterpreted his name, Allenby, as Allah Nebi, the prophet of Allah, who was coming to judge them, and they took off. <laughs> For the first time in 2,000 years, the land of Israel is in the hands of a power that looks with favor on the Jewish people, the British Empire. And the little English boy who prayed for it every night grew up and became General Allenby, the one who fulfilled it. God used the boy. That November, the empire issues the Balfour Declaration, says the land of Israel shall be given to the Jewish people as their homeland. Well, God already did that, but now it is opened up. Jewish people return home and say, this is going to be our homeland. Jubilee, that's what it is. Everyone shall return to their land they lost. When did it take place? November 1917, right in the exact parameter of the Shemitah. Given the time ordained by the Shemitah, seven Shemitah, then Jubilee. Now what happens if we go forward in time, seven Shemitahs to the next seventh Shemitah, could there be another end time prophetic restoration? What is the seventh Shemitah? It, it, it comes to the mid-60s and ordains the period of restoration, if it happens, this cycle, is September 1966 to September 1967. Could there be something prophetic that happens? Big time. The Six-Day War happens. Jerusalem is in the hand of Muslim soldiers again, the, the Kingdom of Jordan. And the Six-Day War happens. The Israel says to Jordan, stay out, but Jordan comes in. And there's fighting, and then all of a sudden, Israeli soldiers approach the temple, actually the, the old city, they approach the Lion's Gate and go in, and for the first time in 2,000 years, Israeli soldiers are walking the streets of their holy city, Jerusalem. They make their way to the Temple Mount after 2,000 years. What is that? That's Jubilee. Everyone shall return to their possession. Jerusalem is the possession of Israel. No matter what the United Nations says, it's the possession of Israel. God said it. And you know, they just put up, I won't even go into it, they just put up the flag of Palestine in the United Nations. You know what Palestine means? Palestine was come up by the Romans. They came up with the word. They said, we want to erase the connection of the Jewish people to the land, so we're going to come up with a name that's going to erase it. And they came up with a name, Palestina. Palestina comes from, well, they got it, it says it literally means the land of the Philistines. That's not what God ordained. And so here they're in Jerusalem as they have to be for Messiah to come again. And what Jubilee, and what happens during the Jubilee? The shofar is sounded. The first thing that happens when they get to the Temple Mount is the shofar is sounded from the Temple Mount. The most famous sounding of the shofar in history, modern times, Rabbi Shlomo Goren is the man who sounds it, the military chaplain with the soldiers. Interesting. Rabbi Shlomo Goren was born in the year 1917, the time of the other Jubilee. 
It's his jubilee. He's 50 years sounding the jubilee of God. Now that's enough. I could go home right now. I'd be satisfied right now. But does it have to continue? No, God is sovereign. He doesn't have to have anything in the next cycle. But if he did, what is the next cycle? The next cycle, the next seventh Shemitah, is the year 2015. And the year following the prophetic time is 2015 to 2016, September 2015 to September 2016. Now, God doesn't have to do anything, but every time it's happened the last two, it has meant this. Number one, war. Number two, war in the Middle East. Number three, war concerning the land of Israel. And number four, the bringing about of a prophetic end time restoration. Now, for you who are God's children and God's servants, the Jubilee can be a time of restoration. This is the, we're in the prophetic Jubilee, it just began. But sometimes you have to fight for that restoration. Now, I'm going to share with you something that you will never hear in the news, an amazing thing. It's a real story behind world events, and I verified this. I spoke to the people involved, the eyewitnesses, including Pastor Ray Bentley in California, a great man of God, and others. In the late 1990s, what the news will never tell you, Benjamin Netanyahu was prime minister of Israel, and in the 1990s, a Christian African minister who was in Texas named Robert Mo Weary got a word where he says, you must speak to the leader of Israel. And amazingly, he came to Dallas, actually, and he said, God said, come to Dallas. He came to Dallas, and you'll meet the man who will connect you. And he came here and actually met the man who led him, who opened the door. He actually gives, is given audience to Netanyahu. And, and Netanyahu, you know, he's used to, you know, in Israel, they have something called the Jerusalem Syndrome, where people come there, and they, they think they're prophets, and they start prophesying. There are real prophets, and there's, there's this. But so Netanyahu said, all right, you have one minute. And he said, remember what we do to prophets who say things that don't come true. <laughs> he turns to Netanyahu and he says, I have placed you in this position, says the Lord. Do not give up the land. Do not give up my land. If you do give up my land, I will remove you from this position. Netanyahu sort of laughed, didn't take it seriously. One of those who witnessed the warning was Ariel Sharon about giving up the land. He, Sharon would later become prime minister and give up land. And he would have a stroke and he'd be removed from power. After the prophecy was given, Netanyahu, under pressure from President Clinton, gave up some of the land with Arafat. Not long after that, his government collapses. He's removed from power. A number of years later, Netanyahu, out of office, ex-prime minister, is in America, in Florida, a gathering in support of Israel. The same African minister's says, I have another word. I have to speak to him again. He gets access again. Netanyahu sees him. This time he remembers him. And this time he takes him seriously. He reads a prophecy, he says to Netanyahu, you will once again become prime minister of Israel. If you honor his covenant that he made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, regarding Israel, he will honor you and exalt you. But if you disregard his covenant and give away his land, he will dishonor you. Be strong and of good courage, for unto this people you shall divide an inheritance, the land which I swore to their fathers I would give them. Mawiri added, do not ever negotiate land for peace. God is not done with you. You will be prime minister again in a critical time of history. Now, at about the same time when Obama came to power in America, Netanyahu was brought back to power in Israel according to that prophecy. And he's been strong since. And the present administration has pressured him, hoping in every way the last time that this last election would remove him from power. It looked like he was going to be removed, yet almost miraculously, he was back in power. Yeah. You, the news will not tell you this. In fact, interesting, those of you who watch this, that night, when everybody say, they're all saying, hey, Netanyahu's finished, finished, and all of a sudden they grew silent. There was no news for about eight hours because Netanyahu was winning. Netanyahu said, all right, if you guys are not going to announce it, I'll announce it. He is now in line to become the longest serving prime minister in the history of Israel. But something else was said to him. In that prophecy was this. You will be the prime minister for the restoration of the tabernacle of David. Yeah. 
What is that? We could do a whole thing on that. We won't do it tonight. But the tabernacle of David can signify the kingdom of Israel, the throne of David. In Acts 15, it is even linked to the church of God. And it can even mean the temple of Jerusalem. A while later, Mawiri saw Netanyahu again. I spoke to an eyewitness. Netanyahu took out a picture, held it up to them, and said, this is what it's all about. What was the picture? It was a picture of the temple of Jerusalem. Now a prophecy here. We are in a prophetic period here of restoration. This is the time, the jubilee. Could it mean the coming of war? It could. We shall see. Either way, what God says he will do. We are to be aware of the signs of the times. Now let's bring it home. We are to know where we are. We can't ignore what's happening. When I came here today on the plane, the pilot said to me, he said, you know, the handwriting's on the wall. We have never seen what we're seeing now. I said, that's right. I believe a great shaking's coming to the world. How can we be safe in the days of judgment? One answer. In Hebrew, the word for safety is Yeshua. And Yeshua is Jesus. He's our safety. He's our rock. He's our refuge. Safest place you can be. If you're in him, get your life. If you're not in him, get in him. He said you must be born again. That's your safety. If you're not born again, you're not saved, get born again. If you are saved and you're asking what's the safest place to be in America, I can answer that. It's not New Jersey. <laughs> the safest place in America is called the will of God. Whatever's in your life that's not in the will of God, it doesn't belong to the will of God, get it out of your life. The time is not tomorrow, it's today. Now is the time. Take the first step before you go to bed. Whatever's not in your life that should be in your life that you know God's calling to become the person of prayer, of faith, of victory that God's calling, take the step today. Get it in. Take the first step before you go to bed. Don't let it be. Don't say tomorrow, it's today. People ask me, what lies ahead, judgment or revival? And I believe the answer may be there can be both. There can be shaking and revival. Many of us came to the Lord because we were shaken. I came to the Lord because I was shaken. I was literally hit by a locomotive train. That's another story. But that Jewish people, we need strong things. I needed a train. <laughs> but so too with nations. A nation can grow so deaf that God must shout. And that there yet through shaking can come a great revival. In fact, it can bring the greatest revival in history. The Bible promises there shall be an end time revival. I will pour my spirit on all flesh. So here you have the love of many. You got evil on one side, but you got God on the other. And God is bigger. It's time to be praying for revival fervently. Time not just to be praying for revival. It's time to actually start living in revival. See, in the end times, we only have time to touch on this, but in the end times, the grays disappear. What happens is the grays disappear, the dark gets darker, but if the dark gets darker, it means the lights of God have to shine brighter. It's time to stand stronger, bolder, uncompromised, and God will anoint you. And as we bring this home, here are some keys. Whatever can be shaken shall be shaken, says the Word of God. Therefore, ground yourself all the more strongly on the Word of God. Plug yourself all the more deeply in the presence of God, in prayer, in focus with God. Number two, do not bend the Word of God to fit your life. Bend your life to fit the Word of God. <laughs> Determine you will stand with God, in God, for God. Make up your mind no matter what happens, no matter what the majority does, no matter what the government does, no matter what the cost, what the price, you will not be intimidated, you will not be silent, you will be bold, you have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Number three, you are not those who try to escape this world. You are those who take the world head on like David took on Goliath and overcome it, as did Paul. David ran to Goliath. Do not fear. Number four, be confident in God. For one thing you can depend on, your God is on the throne. Your, our God is in control. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. He's got you and me, brothers, in his hands. And you and me, sisters, and you and me, babies, in his hands. I want to include everybody inclusive. 
And you want biblical times? You've got it. You want you to be seeing these are the days of Elijah? Well, these are the days of Elijah, but we need to be the Elijahs of the day. And remember, no matter what it looks like, the one who is on the side of God is the one who is on the winning side. A mystery, the age must close as the age began. 2,000 years ago, there was an Israel in the world. Israel's back in the world. 2,000 years ago, there were Jewish believers in the world. They're back. We're back. I'm assigned to you because this is what God said. Your God is real. Your God is true. Your God is faithful. And when he makes a promise, he keeps his word. 2,000 years ago, there were Jews, Jewish and Gentile believers, one in Messiah. You're back. You're back. There was a church that actually loved the Jewish people. You're back. 2,000 years ago, there was a world culture that opposed the gospel like in the book of Acts. Well, that's here. That's here, but that did not stop the people of God. You see, back 2,000 years ago, there were apostles, and there were the people, there was the book of Acts. God wants the church to be as it was then. Book of Acts, again, that's what God wants. In the Hebrew year of mystery, there were two rains outpourings, the former rains and the latter rains. So in the age, there are two rains, two outpourings, the former rains, the day of Pentecost that has changed the world. But there must come the latter rains. Each comes when there are Jewish believers in the world. The former rains have come. It's time for the latter rains to come. 2,000 years ago, there was a people who were filled by the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, and who walked in the power of God and would not be overcome, but overcame, who would not be put, who would be, break the chains that were put on them, who would open prison doors. God wants them again. God wants to raise up the people of the book of Acts again. The same God of the book of Acts is the same God we have now. And as he poured out his spirit, so he will pour out his spirit again. For the eyes of the Lord search the entire earth, looking for the one whose heart is completely his. And he might show himself mighty for that one. You be that one. You be that people. You be that man. You be that woman. And the greatest anointing will come upon your life. If you just say yes to God, not just to what is good, but yes to what is best and great and highest, Lord, the calling of God on your life, then he will anoint you with an anointing that you have not known. That is great. It's time for us to live as the first believers lived. Time to stand as they stood, believe as they believed, keep going as they kept going, break through the chains and the gates as they broke through, and they changed the world to press on, to blaze against the darkness, to overcome this world. For Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus says, I have overcome the world. Take courage. It's time to get single-minded, time to go all out. And when you look at the days ahead, do not fear, but know that he, that greater is he in you than he was in the world. And one last thing to take home with you. To be victorious, remember something. If you are born again, you are a fellow citizen of Israel. The Bible says it. And against that nation Israel, the devil has warred. All hell has warred for 4,000 years to wipe them out. Egypt, the pharaohs tried to stamp them out. The generals of Assyria tried to wipe them away. Babylon tried to destroy them. Rome tried to crush them. Hitler tried to annihilate them. The Soviet Union tried to oppress them. The terrorists tried to get rid of them. But, 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 the pharaohs are gone. Assyria has fallen. Babylon is no more. Rome has crumbled. Hitler is gone. The Soviet Union has collapsed. They'll be gone. They've fallen. They crumble. They perish. But, 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 the nation of Israel lives. I'm Yisrael Chai because the God of Israel lives. Messiah of Israel lives. And if you are in him, you will overcome the world because he's greater than the world, greater than the darkness, greater than the sin, greater than the light of the world, the glory of Israel, the light of the
the tribe of Judah. Rise up, man of God. Rise up, woman of God. Take up your calling for the Lord said the Lord. Kumi ori kiva orach. Arise and shine for your light is come and the glory of the Lord is risen on you. Amen, amen. Praise the Lord. We praise you, Father. Praise you, Father. We bless you. Praise you, Lord. We thank you. You are here in our midst right now. Right now in our midst. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God of Messiah. You are here with your people. Lord, strengthen your people right here in Texas. Strengthen them right here. Father, and strengthen everyone watching. We ask for your anointing to be on each. Father, we ask, Lord, your power, your mantle to be on each. And Lord, we pray for revival. We pray, Father, we know you are greater than what's happening. You are bigger and greater than any nation and any darkness. You are greater. We ask, Lord, whatever it takes, Lord, bring revival to this land. Bring revival, Father. Bring revival to Washington, D.C., Lord. Lord, have your way with the Capitol. Have your way with the White House, Lord. Change the hearts of the leaders or change the leaders of the hearts, but get your way. Have your way, Lord. Lord, we lift up the coastland, New York, we to California, to the heartland. Father, we lift up all the youth. We ask, Lord, raise up a people on fire for you. Touch your churches. Let us not be of compromise. Let us be uncompromised. Let us be filled with your Ruach HaKodesh, your Holy Spirit. And let us be like the book of Acts. Lord, we commit right now whatever we need to do. We will take the first step tonight. We will take the first step to put that thing out of our life and bring that thing into our life to say yes to you. We want to be vessels of your power, vessels of your life, vessels of your life-changing, Lord, power to touch this world for such a time as this, Lord. Father, have your way. And Lord, we ask for revival across this planet, Lord. We ask for the end time revival. We ask for the outpouring, whatever it takes, Father. But help us to be leaders, Lord, not just talking about revival, but living in it now. And Lord, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Have your way. Touch your people. Lord, we have your way and open the eyes that they might cry out to you. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Come, Lord Jesus, Yeshua. Have your way, O oh Lord. We praise you and bless you in the holy, holy, powerful, mighty name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, the light of our lives. In his name, praise you. Amen. We praise you, Lord. We praise you tonight. Thank you for your presence. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, I promised you something. You may be seated for a moment. I promised you something. I want to close with two things. One is I want to give you the blessing in a moment of Aaron. But two, I want to show you, I want to encourage you just to something that, listen, doesn't matter what's happening, God will give you open doors. God is bigger. God's not finished. He always has a plan, always has a way. And a while back, he, on the day after the Supreme Court heard that case, he opened the door for me to speak in Washington. And I said, when I, when I, whenever God does that, I said, you know, I might not have this chance again, so I'm not holding back. It was, lead, it was on Capitol Hill leaders and leaders and members of Congress. And people said, well, that's courageous. I said, no, it's not courageous. I said, I just, I'm a, I fear him more than I fear them. So I want this to encourage you to be, don't be intimidated, be strong, and God will anoint you. So if we can, we have, believe we have that clip, they'll show you a brief clip from that moment, and then I'll give you the blessing. Mr. President, with all respect that is due, what happens if one assumes the presidency by placing his left hand on the Word of God and then with his right hand enacts laws that war against the very same Word of God on which he laid his hand? Such an act invokes the judgment of the Almighty. When the leaders of ancient Israel turned away from God, when they abolished his precepts and broke his covenant, they did so in the shadow of Moses, whose voice cried out to them in warning. Mr. President, when you address the nation from this house, look up. Look up above the senators and the representatives, above the Supreme Court justices and above the invited guests, and you'll see a face, the only full visage in that wall. Looking back at you, it is the face of Moses. 
And if that face could speak, it would say this, no man can overrule the laws of God, no order can annul the order of God, and no judgment of man can stand against the judgments of God. Invoke not his judgment, but choose life. Lead in the way of repentance. Invoke the grace of God that he might have mercy on this land. We've come to a most critical moment. As Elijah stood on top of Mount Carmel and cried out, to Israel in his hour of decision in between two altars and two gods, his voice now cries out to America and says, choose you this day whom you will serve. Seventy years ago, the chaplain of the United States Senate cried out with the same voice and said to this nation, if the Lord be God, then follow him. But if Baal, then follow him and go to hell. Tonight, America stands at the crossroads. And as Elijah came to the summit of Mount Carmel to make a declaration, we've come this night to Capitol Hill to declare that our God is not Baal, our God is not Moloch, our God is not government, our God is not money, our God is not power, not pleasure, our God is not political correctness or any other man-made thing. We've come to this hill to declare that there is only one God and he is the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. He's the God of Israel and of all nations. He alone is the rock upon which this nation has come into existence. And from this high place, we make this declaration. We will not bow down our knees to Baal. We will not bow down our knees to political correctness. We will not bow down our knees to a morality that as, is as shifting as sand in the wind. We will not bow down our knees to the laws and precepts of rebellion or the sacred cows of moral apostasy. We will not bow down our knees to the idols of man. We will not bow down to Baal. We will bow down our knees only to the Lord our God, come what may, and we will have no other gods before him. For some trust in chariots, some trust in princes, some trust in Supreme Courts, some trust in White Houses, some trust in governments, some trust in Wall Street, some trust in powers, and some trust in idols. But we will trust in the name of the Lord our God, in the name above all names, above all kings, above all powers. We will trust in the only name given by which we can be saved. We will trust in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords, the judge of all judges, the light of the world, the glory of Israel, the foundation stone upon which this nation came into existence, and the only answer, the only chance, and the only hope that America has that it might once again shine with the light of the fire of the presence of the glory of the living God and not go to hell. So help us God. Be strong, do not be intimidated, do not bow down except to God, and God will anoint you. I'm going to promise you a blessing, so here's the blessing. The blessing was literally written by God himself. He wrote the words to this, and he says, when you give this to my people, you'll be placing my name upon them. And this was the blessing that was given in the time of the temples because there's those sacred people just, just would bow the name of Messiah or actually of, of the ineffable name of God. And this was given to this Aaron and his sons to give to the people of Israel. I'm from that line. My fathers used to give this in the temple. You are the people of God grafted in. You are Israel with him. And so this blessing is for your life. Please lift up your hands to the Lord. And close your eyes and take this not from man, but as from the Lord. In the language of the Bible. Adonai, 
The Lord bless you, child of God. The Lord God keep you in the center of his will. The Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob calls to shine upon you, his servant, his face. And the Lord pour out from heaven the rivers of his grace upon your life, your home, the works of your hands. The Lord God heaven of heaven and earth, the eternal I am, cause the glory of his presence to be upon your life, to touch every part of your life. And the Lord give to you his shalom, life, fullness, peace, all the blessings of his love, all the blessings of his shalom. Bashem, in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords, or HaOlam, the light of this world, Uchvod Yisrael, the glory of Israel, Va'ari Yehuda, and the lion of the tribe of Judah. Amen and amen. God bless you all in Texas. Love you. God bless you.